Everybody, let's stand and sing. <laughs>
And so we want to uh, speak and sing and hear tonight under his blood and his righteousness. Thank you that we're accepted in him and in him alone. Uh, we thank you for the gospel. We pray that it will be uh, plain and clear to us as we uh, think about how to parent, and as we think about how you want us to raise children and live the Christian life. Uh, Father, we pray for uh, everyone here who is a parent tonight. Uh, we ask that you would make us better parents. Uh, pray for my own self. Make me a better dad. Uh, I pray, Father, for our Sunday school teachers and youth workers and even those who are not yet parents but desire to be in the future. Uh, Lord, we thank you uh, that you have good purposes and plans for our children and our youth here and that many of those good purposes, including salvation, come by means. And one of those means is raising them in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. And Father, we just need your wisdom and your mercy, uh, and insight that only the Holy Spirit can give, and the teaching of Scripture to enable us to raise our kids in a way that's pleasing to you. And Father, I want to pray uh, for the youth and the children of our church. We thank you that every Sunday, the majority of the people in this room are, are under the age of 18, and that really bodes well uh, for our church in the future. And we want to ask that every one of those children, uh, every one of those young people, would be regenerated, born again by the power of the Holy Spirit, that they be truly converted, uh, and that they would live godly lives, and that they in turn would have children who would live godly lives, and that even our great-grandchildren, Father, uh, should, should Christ tarry, uh, could go on living a legacy of godliness and Christ-likeness and impacting the world for Jesus' sake. Uh, we thank you for Craig and Yvonne and for their willingness to come and speak to us and to teach us and to minister to us. We pray that uh, you would help us to get to know them in their time here and help them to get to know us. And we pray that you would guide their thinking and guide their speaking and that you would uh, give them the words that we need to hear the most. Uh, we pray that they would be led by your spirit, Lord, in all that they do. We pray that you'd speak through them to us and that you would give us ears to hear. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Craig, it's all yours, man. <laughs> all right. Do I need to go? Yeah, I was going to say, um, <clears throat> got some handouts. Um, everybody needs one of these. Okay. All right. All right. Well, those are coming around. I'm going to 
gonna set some alarms here, so I can. I'm just gonna give you half of this side. Oh, no. <laughs> so I can finish on time. Because you know how it goes with anybody behind the pulpit, right? They don't finish on time unless they set an alarm. Yeah. <laughs> so I need to finish at what, 7.30? So Yvonne and I have been married uh, since 1992, and uh, we didn't wait too long before we started having kids, and then we had four and four and a half years. So we had them all pretty close together. Our oldest is turning 30 this year, so you can do the math and figure out how old they are now. Uh, with three of, three of those kids now have kids of their own, so we've got um, we've got five grandchildren. Well, we have six grandchildren, and one of those is on the way. Let's say it that way. So. I uh, have one that's due in the spring, and uh, she's doing well. And um, so we've been at Grace Community Church in Maryville uh, since 2007, I think. Since 2007, and we moved from Southern California to Tennessee to get out of California. I was telling Pastor Brent that uh, we moved out of California before it was cool. Um, so we moved to, to get out of California to move to Tennessee and we've, and we landed, we weren't looking for a church like Grace Community Church. Uh, we just fell into Grace Community Church by God's grace and we just loved it when we got there. We knew we were looking for a solid church. We didn't know what a solid church looked like. And we walked in there, heard the preaching and saw all the little kids that were well behaved around the church laying on their parents and stuff through the church service. And we thought this place has got something going on. And so we've really enjoyed being there. And we've been able to serve too. And um, I've been a deacon there for, I don't know, since 2014 or something. Uh, they actually brought me on as a deacon to, to, to sort of start a counseling ministry there. And I did that and got it going. And now we've sort of handed that off to one of the elders there. He's doing that now. Uh, but in the process, Yvonne and I both got um, certified as biblical counselors through uh, the Association of Biblical Counselors and certified biblical counselors. And then I ended up, we have a guy at our church who was a trainer for that and he recruited me to train with him. So I ended up doing the uh, ACBC classes. There's a 30 hour fundamentals class to do in order to get started in that process. Well, I ended up teaching with him and I would end up teaching the parenting and the marriage portions of that plus some other stuff. Um, so anyway, that's how I sort of ended up being called upon to, to come and do a conference here because I also teach a Sunday school class uh, of folks like you with uh, that, that, that are all, they all have young kids pretty much. Uh, they're not all that, you know, they're not all young, young people, but they all have young kids. Uh, and, and then we have a bunch of young marrieds in there. And then we do a, a newlyweds class on, or a newlyweds group on Tuesday nights that are just strictly marrieds without kids. And so it sort of hit both sides of it. But, uh, so anyway, I regularly teach in this Sunday school class, and we end up teaching on parenting topics quite a bit, uh, not exclusively, but talk about marriage too. So I really appreciate you guys having me here and the opportunity to talk this weekend 
Uh, we've learned a lot with all this, with this 30 plus years of being married and having kids, we've learned a lot uh, about parenting, uh, recognizing those things that we did well and uh, some that we could have done better. And so as I stand here tonight, don't uh, think that we did everything perfect. And I'm saying you guys need to make sure you do it our way or, or the way we did. Because that's not the case at all. Uh, looking back on some things, we're thinking we could have done that better. And, and there's learning to be done. And obviously teaching a class like that and counseling uh, people with kids and counseling marriages uh, we've, we've learned some things along the way, so I'm hoping to be able to impart uh, quite a bit of that to you guys and Yvonne too uh, over this weekend. So I uh, hope this is going to be a really profitable time. And I do think, I don't know about Yvonne, but I think I'm going to shoot you guys with a lot of stuff. So uh, you know, definitely use those pens on those papers and, and grab a lot of stuff off of those, uh, off of what we're saying. Um, we love uh, helping parents uh, as we're able, and uh, we're hoping that we can communicate a lot of helpful truth to you guys. Uh, before I forget, uh, we're going to be doing some question and answer too. So uh, we're doing these two sessions tonight, and then tomorrow morning we're going to divide up moms and dads to different spaces, and we're going to talk directly to the moms and the dads separately. Uh, and so we'll have some question and answer time after that. But I think we're going to try and fit in some question and answer at the very end as well. So if you have questions, you know, write those down before you forget them. And if you'd like to get those to us between the sessions or after we're done tonight or whenever, that'd be great. Because then we can think about it a little bit before we maybe give you a more solid answer, right? If, if we can know about it ahead of time. Um, one thing I have reminded my young marrieds and young parents Sunday school class on occasion is that it, it isn't rocket science, uh, but there's two ways to learn things. You either are going to learn things the hard way by experience, right, and the school of hard knocks, right, and or uh, you've gone through the effort of learning from those who took the hard knocks already. So you either are going to learn the hard way by doing it yourself, or you're going to learn from the people who have either done the hard knocks, or they've learned from people who have had the hard knocks and have put things, have put things together to, to let you know, to help you out. So... You know, that's going to mean doing some study. And, and I've got the backing of the book of Proverbs on this, right? The book of Proverbs commends the second way, not the first way. It commends the second way of learning and planning for success via hearing the counsel from others. And when I'm saying that, I'm not necessarily saying, listen up because I've got all the answers this weekend. That's not it at all. What I am saying is that reading is going to be super important as a parent, um, the best time to formulate your plan and to develop your convictions regarding parenting is before having children. You know, as Pastor Brent said, you know, some people are planning on having kids. That's great. If you're here and you're planning on having kids, you don't have them at all, that is, this is a great time to be learning about being a parent is when you don't even have kids yet. However, the second best time to learn about having, being a parent would be this coming week after been here for a weekend, right? And have it fresh on your mind and you've got things to think about and you've got hopefully some convictions made and some things that maybe you thought I can tweak or I can change or I can improve in my parenting. Uh, but it requires planning. It requires actually thinking it through and being intentional. We're obviously not going to cover all there is to say about biblical parenting this weekend, nor am I gonna say everything there is to say about what the Bible says about parenting in this session. There's so much more to be learned, and that's going to come from reading it and finding it from other sources. We're going to say a lot, uh, and I hope this is enlightening, obviously, uh, but uh, to be very straightforward, as Christian married people and parents, we have a responsibility to reflect Christ with both, both individually and in our families. None of us does this perfectly all the time. None of us is consistent in doing the right things and doing the things that are glorifying to God all the time in our parenting or in our marriages. So even though this Friday night and a Saturday morning hearing about parenting is useful, and tell you what, I, I'm excited to see, to see anybody who's going to show up on a Friday night and a Saturday morning to learn about parenting. It's, it's wonderful. I love seeing you guys here. But this is not going to be the end all of what you need in order to parent well. So, you guys have that resource sheet in your hand with those QR codes. 
those are some of the resources that we're familiar with that we would recommend. And if you can build up a library of those, uh, that would be fantastic. Although I realize, and we had a lot of years when that wasn't in the budget for me to buy a bunch of books and, and build my library like that. So, you know, fit it into the budget as you can. But to have the good books on the shelf is a great thing and to be able to go back to those things on a regular basis. Now, I do want to mention, I checked, I checked Fontana Regional Library and they actually have, they have a, they have apps on there that I use all the time called Libby and called Hoopla. And they're audiobooks and they're ebooks. And they've got a lot of great Christian resources on there. I, I regularly see stuff on there from MacArthur, Piper, Moeller, Schaefer, Ryle, Spurgeon. So there's some really good stuff on there. So if you've got a library card, you might be able to access some of this stuff without having to buy all the books, right? So there is stuff out there, but I would highly recommend getting the books as you're able because you will be going back to them all, you know, all the time. And whatever age your kids are at now, they're not staying at that age. They're going to continue to progress. I know this is the, this is the time for revelation of real important things. So you're, you're going to be, they're going to be progressing and moving on. So you want to be ready for those next times, those next stages that are coming up. Proverbs will tell us the value of wisdom available anytime you want to pick it up is worth sacrificing something else for. You're, it's okay to, to cut, you know, you know, some kind of fast food run during the week or something to buy a book instead. Uh, th there, is, there is value in sacrificing something else in order to have the resources available. To keep our heads on straight, we need reminding as we're going to discuss this weekend, we can only lead our children where we have gone and or where we are heading. So if we're not growing, if we, if we need to consistently grow in our spiritual maturity to be able to encourage children to do the same, we, we need to be able to stay ahead of them, so to speak. We need to be focusing our own spiritual growth in order to help them grow. We can't point them and say, you need to be growing. <laughs> it's not going to work. We need to, they need to know that we are growing and that we can pull them with us as we go. We can point, but we better be heading in that same direction. We better be growing and making sure that they're aware of the growth that we are, that we are moving towards and that we are striving for in our own lives. Counselor Sam Stevens said it directly. You have to have a plan. You have to clear goal. You have to have clear goals. You need to walk into parenting with the plan. Sanctification doesn't happen in fuzzy land, which means sanctification is real and you it's it happens in the reality of life. As things come up, you apply the word and, it's, and you become more sanctified as you do that. So that's what he means. Sanctification doesn't happen in fuzzy land, and that can definitely be applied in parenting. If you try to walk into it, you can have the best intentions, but if you don't have a plan and goal in shepherding your children, it's going to be that much more difficult to be successful. Intentionality. We have to be intentional. We, we're parents. We're, if, you're, if you already have kids, you're already parents. But that doesn't mean it's just going to come naturally. That doesn't mean you're just going to figure it out as it goes along. We need to be intentional in having an idea of where we're going and what we're going to do with our, parent, with our kids before we get to the stage, before we get to the problems, before we get to the difficulties and all the things that go on with kids when they're growing up. Before those things come up, we need to have a plan for, to address those things. And a big part of that plan, well, we're going to get to that, but a big part of the plan is going to be our own spiritual growth. As we are growing ourselves, and we're learning in the Word, we're learning how to apply, we're going to better be able to help our kids do the same. Ted Tripp in Shepherding a Child's Heart says, This is your calling. You must raise your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. You cannot do so without investing yourself in a life of sensitive communication in which you help them understand life and God's world. There is nothing more important. You have only a brief season of life to invest yourself in this task. You have only one opportunity to do it. You cannot go back and do it over. Kids are going to be in our house for 18, 20 years. Hopefully not a whole lot more than that, right? <laughs> so, so they're going to be in our house for only a few years comparative to the rest of their life. We only have so long to train into them to love God's word, to 
pursue spiritual maturity, to apply God's word into the things that come on and that come to them in their life. We need to keep in mind that obligation to parent well is the obligation to steward well. These are God's children. I mean, not in the sense that they're all saved, certainly, but they are created by him and they are created in his image. And so he's placed them in our stewardship in order to train them up. And that's an amazing thought. When you consider that the God of the universe, the creator, the one that has created these little babies, that he places them in our homes and trusts us to train them up and to point them to him. It's an amazing responsibility, but it is a stewardship, and we are called to take that seriously. So what is the instruction to parents in Scripture? Well, let's start uh, with the goal of all believers. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Of course, out of this came the Westminster Confession statement, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. So how do we know how to glorify God? How do we know what God's glory looks like? Like, what does this mean to glorify God in everything? God has revealed a lot about himself and his will and his word. He has preserved his word, and he expects his redeemed to love and read, and read his word. He expects us to be in his word. He's revealed himself and, and preserved his word, the, his revelation to us of both him and his will he has preserved that for us, and he expects us to read it and to apply it. 2 Peter 1, 2 through 4. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him, who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these... He has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Psalm 19, 7 through, 1, 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Who are more simple than children? The word is for making wise the simple. Children are simple. Even Jesus, when he refers to children's faith, highlights the fact that they are simple. It's, a, it's their simplicity that, is, that Jesus highlights as their faith. Proverbs has much to say about the simplicity of children, and we're going to discuss Proverbs as we go along quite a bit, actually. So picking up verse 8, The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing in the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. God's given us the manual. He's given us the manual for living. He's, it's not like he's left us, you're created, and you, you exist, figure it out. He's given us the manual to live according to his will and in the way that's best for us. So we have the manual, and when one follows a manual, if you're building something and you've got a manual to build it, you're going to save yourself from a lot of errors, right? You're not going to get to the end and go, okay, i got to take it all. This is what I usually do. I skip the manual, I build it, and then find out I'm completely off on one part and i got to start over. i got to take it all apart and start over, right? That's not going to happen if we're following the manual. So God's granted that to us. And finally, at the end of verse 11, in keeping, their, in keeping them, his law, his words, his will, there is great reward. And isn't that, isn't that not what we want to instill in our children? Is that not what we want for our children? Is the great reward of doing what God would have them to do? 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Now, does this describe parenting well enough? Teaching, reproving, correcting, training? 
Don't we all want our kids to be people of God, equipped for every good work? I mean, that explains what we ought to be doing right there. The scripture is the means by which this is accomplished. For teaching, actively instilling God's will and wisdom into them. For reproof, showing the child where he's gone wrong and where he has missed the mark, where he has not done God's will. For correction, showing the right way. So he's been told in reproof what he did wrong. For correction, showing the right way as opposed to the wrong way. As in Ephesians 4, putting off the sin, putting on righteousness. They need to be shown how to do this. And parents are the ones that God has put in place to do that. Training in righteousness, showing the practical outworking of righteousness as, as the only way, only means of being righteous before the holy God by trusting in the vicarious work of Christ on the cross for us. That's the only way to gain righteousness. Any righteousness is only of Christ. So that's what we're called to do as parents. And as we use the word and as we apply it and show them how to apply it and we, we make their sin known in the, as we show them the word as they sin and that they can recognize that they are accountable to that holy God. More specifically to parents, we read in Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9. And this one you may have expected to come because this is, this is real parenting material here. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. So this is instruction to the Israelite parents. And we take it by extension as God's will for us as well. The command is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might. And Jesus reiterates this command in Matthew 12, or Matthew 22, Mark 12, and Luke 10. And he states of this command that it's the greatest and foremost of all commandments, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might. So we're all commanded to love the Lord with all of our being. We're to keep God's word on our heart. Before we even get to imparting God's word to our kids, we must prioritize his word, have our own hearts attuned, and we should be living accordingly before we can impart that to our kids. <coughs> then it goes on, starting in verse 7. You shall teach them the words and the commands of God diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So parents are commanded to diligently teach God's word to their children. So we have this love for God with all of our being, and that's what we want to impart to our kids. And we do it by way of diligently teaching them God's word. Now the means for diligently teaching God's word are, what does it say there? It says we're going to be talking about it, essentially all the time. It says when you sit in your house, as you travel around, when you get bed, when you, when you get up in the morning, the reminders of God's words are to be always handy. It says here, the frontals and the bindings, just meaning it's on their person. They have it handy. They have it ready to, to, uh, to refer to. And written on the doorposts and the gates. It's all around. You, you have the scripture available all the time and in view of the children. And it's being discussed on a regular basis. Notice that there's no part of the day that's excluded. It's from the time we get up in the morning to the time we go to bed. Parenting, training in God's word is the task at hand all day long. In other words, parents are instructed to teach their children about how God's word relates to all of life within the home and outside the home. When we're in the home, when we talk about it, when we're out and we're walking along the road, we're talking about it. We have opportunity to apply God's word to all kinds of things that are going on in our kids' lives. So as a family is sitting around and discussing what went, through, went on throughout the day, parents relate what the word says and how it applies to the argument a son got into with his coworker. 
or how your toddler got bit in Sunday school by another obviously less godly child. <laughs> or discussing something your 10-year-old didn't understand from the sermon or from school. Parents explain the godly sacrificially explain <laughs> the godly sacrificially loving way to respond to a nasty neighbor and a million other things that come up. So as these things come up, we are discussing them. How does the word apply? Parents do this again and again. Bedtime, at the breakfast table, when the kids get up, when, they're driving, when you're driving around in the car. Deuteronomy 6 is how to, with the, the, the directions he gives here in how to do this. Parents are training while life happens. We, don't, we can train our kids while we sit in the living room and we have devotional time as a family. Or you have Bible class for homeschooling or whatever it is. You can sit, you know, they can hear it in Sunday school. You can, that's the training. That, or they hear that. That's the, the teaching, really. But the training comes when life happens. When you have something to talk about. How does the word apply to this specific situation? And how is it going to apply to this other situation that's similar? So that they start learning how the word applies in life overall. So parents are to communicate what the word says regarding all their children's experience. All that they experience, all that they see, all that they hear. All that they're going to run into in the future. By having the word handy and talking about it with them all the time. Now when I say having the word handy, I mean... Not only having the word always physically near, which isn't too tough to do with a smartphone in your pocket, right? You've got the word right there. It's right, we have it in our pocket all the time. If you Blue Letter Bible app or whatever, which is a great app, I highly recommend Blue Letter Bible. So we have the word physically near, but more so we know the word so that the parents can discuss it appropriately and with authority. With authority, meaning it's made perfectly clear to the children that the Bible is the manual and it's the standard for life and godliness. So they, the, the children understand the value that the parents place on God's word. They should see and hear and feel in our homes the importance of God's word to us and to our family life. So, so with all that being said, here's an important factor for training to training as parents. The plain fact is that we can only teach the word if we know the word. And we can only know the word if we are intaking the word regularly. In addition, as all of God's word is useful, listen to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 again. All scripture is inspired, literally meaning breathed out by God. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, to training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. We can't just, if all scripture is inspired, and all, which it is, and if all scripture is useful for these things, we can't just know portions of the Bible. We need familiarity with all of the word. If someone doesn't understand the Old Testament, why it's important, how it relates to Jesus and their life, which is common amongst even people who have been believers for a long time, if they haven't read the word. And even reading the word, it doesn't mean you're going to understand what you're reading, particularly in the Old Testament. There's a lot of different kinds of literature in the Old Testament. There's a lot of things going on in the Old Testament that without some training, some people don't get it. And that's understandable, right? Uh, it's understandable for that to be the case. I don't think it's understandable to stay in that state. So, I would recommend asking Pastor Brent what he recommends. But getting a good Old Testament survey book would be a great idea. So that you can get a broad idea of what the Old Testament is about and how it applies to the New Testament, if you don't know. Or, here's a good one for the homeschool crowd. Masters University, I had to look this up recently for something else, but Masters University... I think it's 27 lectures they have online, Old Testament survey by Abner Chow, for free. 
So you can go on there, search for Abner Chow, Masters University, Old Testament Survey, and you can watch through those 27 lectures, which I'm guessing is his class for Old Testament Survey at Masters University, for free. And that'll give you a wonderful understanding of what the Old Testament, about the Old Testament. It would be a great way to get started. One counselor writing for biblicalcounseling.com, which is a popular place for me to go. I like there. I like going there. But what does the, she says, what does the scripture say? Is the question Christian parents must continually ask in order to divorce secular ideologies from the revealed truth of, of God's word. So that should be a regular question in our homes. What does the scripture say? This thing happened. This is going on in this child's life. What does the scripture say? And how do we apply it? She goes on, parents have an obligation to know what the word of God says and use biblical truth as the remedy against the lies of secular ideologies. Whatever's being taught in schools should be defined in biblical terms with true fidelity to scripture. Sin must be called out by its name to counteract the deliberate attempts to call evil good and good evil. So, I'm sure you guys are well aware that there's a whole lot out there of calling evil good and good evil. Our kids are being inundated with calling evil good and good evil. And I don't think it's getting better. I don't think it's going to improve. So we need to train them. What does the scripture say? So that they can evaluate these things and they can come to the truth. They can see the false ideologies that are out there. If we don't train them, it's not going to happen. We skip over the New Testament now. We read in Ephesians 6, 4, which may be the other verse you thought I was going to bring up this morning or this evening. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Parents are to bring up their children in the discipline and instruction of God's word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not anyone else's responsibility. No one else is accountable for the task. God has placed it in the parents' responsibility and accountability to train up their children. Nobody else is accountable for this. Only the parents. Secondly, it's to be done without provoking them to anger. In other words, parents are responsible to develop and keep relationship as they train. You want to maintain the relationship with your child as you train. And we're going to talk more about that in the sessions to come. Colossians 3.21 gives a little bit different angle on it. It says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. Parents are commanded to live, communicate to, and train their children in such a way that they are not disheartened or dismayed. God's word is to be communicated as a blessing while maintaining loving, open, joyful relationships with their children. We have to keep that connection with them. We need to be loving them sacrificially. When they feel our sacrificial love, they are going to be drawn to what we believe. They're going to be drawn to what we say. They're going to be drawn to the truth that we are imparting to them. Of course, all this training parents are responsible for requires communication. So without effectively communicating, parents are not able to accomplish this. We just can't develop relationships with our children, train them, to be godly by word and example without communicating well. So if you need to learn in communication, I have what you need. There are some great audios on biblical communication and a bunch of other great topics. CompetentCounsel.org. I'm sorry, I meant to put a QR code for that too, but CompetentCounsel.org. Uh, these are, there's a whole bunch of audios on there. They're in a Google file or something. You can just download them. There's probably about 10 or 15 of them. I think there's about 15, maybe more. Uh, Lou Priolo. He's written lots of books. We're going to talk about some of his stuff this weekend. Um, just great stuff on communication, marriage, parenting, thinking like a Christian, anger, etc. Family devotions, anybody? Listen through those and talk about them. Just great stuff there. We communicate by our example. Parents cannot set a path for children to travel apart from children observing parents traveling that path themselves. They need to see us desiring God. They need to see us 
pursuing God. If your child, this is something to consider, if, you try, if your child followed your example in every way, would that be the perfect result you would want for them? I don't think any of us are going to stand up and say, yep, that's me, all the way. However, that's the reality. That's the challenge. That's what the expectation is. We are setting an example for good or bad. We are communicating what's important and what should be done by what we actually do. They're watching us. Children are observing us all the time. They're always paying attention to what we do. And they know what's valuable to us and what's not. You've probably heard that most of what children and adults, by the way, learn is caught more than taught. They learn by observation. They hear what we say. Yeah, they're learning by what we're t- telling them. But they are catching more than, we're, than they're learning from what we tell them. They learn to imitate what their parents and other people that they're exposed to do. <clears throat> so children need to be exposed to the right examples. That should be the parents, but all the others also. In 1 Peter 5, Peter exhorts the elders to be examples to their flock. Paul told his spiritual, his, sorry. Paul told his spiritual children. In the church at Corinth, be imitators of me just as I also am of Christ. Shouldn't we be the same to our children? They're our little flock in our home, right? They're the ones that we are ministering. They're our main primary ministry. Shouldn't we be saying that to them? Follow me as I follow Christ. And then being careful to set an example worthy of imitation. So how do we communicate by our examples? Well, in a very recognizable way, by our spiritual disciplines. Do they see us in the word? Do they hear us in prayer? Do they know that we care to pursue what's necessary to, be, to grow in our maturity and into our, in a relationship with God? Parents need to evaluate. Do my children observe us as parents pursuing godliness and studying God's word in prayer, in faithfully attending the preaching of the word, in practicing the one another's, in giving? So in all these ways, can they look at our life and say, my parents love God. My parents want to do what God would have them to do. My parents want to please him. And it's not hard for our kids to understand what's important to us. All they need to do is observe what we do with our time, what we do with our money. Look at those two things. They can figure out what's important to us. Regardless of what we say, those are the indicators that are going to tell them what's important to us. We communicate to our kids as they listen to us pray. Are we thankful? How do we expect our children to be thankful and appreciative if they don't hear us being thankful for the great grace that God has given us? They need to hear us appreciating our spouses and our spiritual leaders. They need to hear us expressing thanks for God's great grace in salvation. They need to hear the gospel in our prayers. They need to hear the gospel from our direct instruction to them as well as in our conversation. The home should be saturated with gospel speak, so to speak. That's the overarching priority of our parenting. Godly parents are focused on the children's souls. Ephesians 6, 4 tells fathers, and by extension, the helpmate mothers, to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The primary instruction of Lord Jesus Christ is repent and believe in the gospel. So if we're going to bring them up in the instruction of the Lord, that's what we're going to tell them. Repent and believe in the gospel. Parents must keep their eyes on eternity as they love and train their children. Think often of their souls, J.C. Ryle says. Apart from the work of the Holy Spirit and a believing child, he or she is not able to fully obey in heart and deed. Apart from the child becoming a new creature, they will continue to rebel against God and being told what to do because they are inherently selfish and sinful. They're going to remain that way apart from God doing a work of salvation in them. A couple more things for this session. Parenting is a long haul. Maybe some of you have already experienced some of the long haul, right? Or at least you're looking at the long haul. Mm -hmm. Especially if you have a difficult child. You're like, another 18 years of this? Parenting is a long haul. It's much easier to endure when our expectations are realistic. 
So when we know it's a long haul, when we know it's going to be a project for a lot of years, when we know we need to be faithful for a long time, it's a lot easier to stick with it and persevere. So keep that in mind. It's a long haul. And we have, we have a very relatively short time, but we do have years to instill into them. MacArthur makes the point in his book, What the Bible Says About Parenting, or I think something close to that, that parenting should be joyful. It's hard when parents make it hard by not living according to God's word. It doesn't have to be difficult. It's a long haul and it is work, but it doesn't have to lack joy. Finally, children have questions, parents have answers. Now notice there's a comma after parents because that's an imperative, not a statement. Okay? That's saying parents have answers. Ken Ham's book, Already Gone from a few years ago, states data from huge studies of formerly church-going kids. These are church-going kids that are now in college or grown up or out, and they've denied the faith and gone away. They've denied what their parents taught them. They've denied what they learned in church, and they don't care anymore. And so they interviewed these people to find out what happened. And they didn't find out that the kids got tanked out of Christianity, so to speak, in college. They didn't get tanked out in high school. Those things confirmed, those times, those college and high school years, confirmed what they were already leaning towards already. They were already tanked out junior high and earlier. So we have a responsibility as parents to have answers to the questions. That doesn't mean we have to have an answer right then when they ask it. But we need to get them answers to their questions. And they're going to ask big questions. They're going to ask questions about why is there suffering in the world for, with a, God, a good God? I mean, why isn't God destroying all evil? They're going to ask these questions. And if we don't have answer, stuff about evolution and creation and all these things, if they're going to ask these questions. If we don't have answers for them and we don't find answers for them, they're going to think there's nothing to this. So we as parents have the opportunity and the responsibility to get them the answers. says, 1 Peter 3.15, says, Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Communicating and demonstrating Christ as Lord, always being ready to make a defense to every child who asks you to give an account for the hope that's in you, with gentleness and reverence. We're called to these things as believers. How much more should it be true as parents? We have children in our home that we can instill these things into. Will this require a knowledge of the word and maybe learn some apologetics? Yes, it is. So we're going, we're going to finish where we started, essentially. Parents must always be learning, most importantly in God's word, conforming to it as examples, investing in relationships with their children, and pointing to Christ as the Savior. So some main points to keep in mind from this one. God places the responsibility and accountability of training our, our children in our stewardship. We are to train our children as life happens, always ready to help them apply the word to what it, they experience, they see, and they hear. We need to know the word if we're going to teach the word, which means we need to be in the word. It's lots of work and life-consuming while children are home, but knowing and planning for that truth is helpful. We communicate more by our example than by our words. And we need to have answers for the questions, which requires even more work. So I think we're going to take a break. Yes, yes. Let's, uh, let's take a break for about 10 minutes. We need to use the bathroom, use the bathroom, we'll drink downstairs. We'll come back up in 8 to 10 minutes. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay.
just needs a little a little drink tray. Nick, will you unmute the keyboard? Thank you. Did he survive? We'll see. Okay. <laughs> it's a three pager. <laughs> Just be careful of this microphone. Okay. It's pretty hot. Go for it. It's you.
Okay, if you guys want to get the sheets out that say child training, when, where, why, how, in some order, I can't remember which order I put them in for you guys. Um, I might be talking a little more, well, I'll definitely be talking a little more practically, I think. Should have handed those out already, I think. Yeah, if you need one, they're up here. And Lee will give it to you. <laughs> All right. I got started last time. I realized I could hardly read the paper, so you might see me like this more this time. <laughs> so let's start with the why. That's always the best place to start in any endeavor, right? You know, if you don't know the reasons for doing something, it's much more difficult to keep going doing it. Uh, I was recently listening to a book on habits. Uh, which, by the way, I listen to a lot more. I read books, but I also listen to a lot more books, which those apps that I was telling you about, the Libby and Hoopla, a lot of uh, audiobooks on there, great stuff. Anyway, I was listening to this book on habits, and it was uh, told some tests were done by deter to determine people's level of endurance. So having starved the participants for a meal or two, the researchers put warm chocolate chip cookies on a plate in the middle of the table where the participants were supposed to sit and wait for the researchers to come back. Some of the participants have been told, uh, we are measuring endurance in these tests. We would really appreciate it if you please don't eat the cookies. <laughs> the other test group were flatly admonished, don't eat the cookies. Which group do you think took the longest before they started eating the cookies? The first group. The first group took longer to start eating the cookies. Why? They all started eating the cookies eventually, by the way. <laughs> but, the, uh, but the first group took lo a lot longer, actually. Why? Because they were told, and they said why. Because they were told what was going on, so they understood the reason for why they were there, what they were doing, and uh, understood why they were being asked nicely to help to do the project. The second group essentially just didn't like being told what to do and didn't really see the point of not eating the cookies. <laughs> so they gave in relatively quickly. <laughs> Now, my point in relaying this is raising uh, the value of knowing why we are doing something. We have to know why we're doing something. Although uh, there are things to be said about asking children nicely. So the point I'm making here is that we need to know why we're doing this. Why are we training our kids? But uh, there's also a point to be made in there about that little story I told in uh, saying please and thank you to our children when we are asking them to do something. And, and when I say asking, I mean asking them to do Of course, you're expecting them to do it because you're the parent, right? But you're asking them to do it, not telling them. So not that you can't tell them, but I'm just saying you're probably going to get further on by saying please and thank you and speaking to them in a respectful way that you would expect them to speak to you or somebody else, right? You're training them in the way you talk to them also. Don Whitney says regarding the spiritual discipline, so he's talking about the spiritual discipline, he says discipline, and this applies to all things though, discipline without direction is drudgery. In other words, it's hard to keep doing anything apart from keeping our eyes on a larger purpose to the day-to-day -day discipline of doing the work that's required. So if we know the reason, if we know the end point, it's not drudgery, we can keep going in it because we understand the reason for the, the discipline because we have the direction. So the objective we're shooting for when we practice spiritual disciplines is Christ-likeness. By extension, the goal of parenting is training children toward Christ-likeness. Of course, apart from trusting in Christ's work on the cross and repentance, the child is unable to become like Christ, lacking the enabling of the Holy Spirit to do so. So we go back to the overarching reason that we're doing things, the overarching purpose that we need to keep in mind is to tell them the gospel, to instill in them the truth of the fact that they're a sinner and they need a savior and that Christ is that savior. Now, you guys maybe have listened to motivational speakers or old school Zig Ziglar or something like that. So if you, if you listen to, to guys that are motivational speakers or they write books about these kinds, kinds of things, uh, you know, a lot of what they say about setting goals, um, you know, those overachieving motivational types when they talk, 
when they talk about making goals, they, they, they make a good point and they say that the why is the driving reason. If you don't have a real why, you're not going to follow through whatever goal it is you're setting for yourself. You're not going to follow through with the discipline. If you want to set a goal for, for running a marathon, you basically need to schedule the marathon so you know that you're going and, you, need, you know, they say you're more committed when you put the money down. Well, that's, that's the kind of thing that we need as parents. We need to be looking at the goal, where we're going, and keep that in our eyesight. So what is the number one reason why we train our children? <coughs> What's, what is the why? What's the main why? Well, I don't know what this main why, but this is the number one why, because God commands it. He commands us, we already talked about that last session, he commands us as parents to train our children. So we're going to talk about what training uh, looks like and maybe some real ways, hopefully we'll get into some real ways of how to go about doing that. Now, if you have your Bible, please turn to Hebrews 12. It's Hebrews 12. And we're going to look at verses 4 through 11. And I'm going to keep going because I have more notes than I should for this. So, uh, You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood and your striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So we read there that God disciplines those he loves as sons. Part of our adoption into the family of believers, the church, is that God deals with us as sons. And part of being a son It is assumed, part of being a son or child, it is assumed that we will be disciplined for the purpose of growing in holiness. We see this assumption expressed in verse 8. It says, basically it says, a son will be disciplined. It's what parents do. They discipline. It's right to do so, as Hebrews 12, the passage I just read, is making the point that we are like God when we do, when we train, and when we discipline. We are being like God, because that's what he does with his sons, with those who are in his family, the church. And he does it for the purpose of making them holy. If we skip down to verse 11, it says, Discipline isn't joyful, but sorrowful for the moment. Now, it's not joyful for the child, but it's not joyful for parents either. Any or all of us as parents who have disciplined children know this is very true, particularly when the parent is also trying to be patient as they discipline for what feels like the 100th time for the same offense. It doesn't seem joyful at all at that point, right? But... What does it say? It says peaceful fruit is produced from training with discipline. While the training doesn't feel peaceful, parents aren't disciplining for the sake of the training. We're not, they're not doing the discipline for the sake of doing discipline, for the sake of doing training. God commands us to do the training, but it's not for the sake of training. It's for the sake of the fruit of righteousness, the peaceful fruit of righteousness that comes out of the training. As an easy analogy to this, you can see fruit in an orchard. You don't get the fruit when you plant them. You get the fruit after a long time of watering and growth and pruning and fertilizing, protecting from the pests and weather. It's the long haul, as we said last session. It's a long process, or at least we have several years to do the process. Now, in verse 11, that word that is translated here, trained, at least in the NASB that I'm using, 
uh, it says, is the same one translated in 1 Timothy 4, 7, and 8 that says, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. So just stick with me here. It's the word trained in verse 11 is actually the same word. We're talking about discipline and training, so I'm just make sure it's not getting confusing here. So that word, the word discipline is training is the same word in 1 Timothy 4, 7, 8 that's discipline is discipline. <laughs> that, is, that is translated as di discipline. <laughs> So, it refer, and that word, it refers to rigorous exercise, working out, as in the gym or on the track, for the, for the purpose of being able to compete. In fact, the word, the word is gymnazo. It's the word that we get gymnasium from. It's a, it's a word that essentially means working out hard so that you can be ready to compete. It's hard work requiring time, effort, consistency, and endurance. The person who wants to compete needs to prepare over a long period, doing whatever it is that they're going to compete in over and over and over and over, right? The person who goes to the gym or the track just a couple times isn't going to compete, or he might try and compete, but he's going to be sadly lacking, right? And some of you may know what I'm talking about when I mention endurance, and over and over, because some kids just require longer sustained effort than others do. And that's the truth. The kids are different. They have different temperaments, and we need to know what those are. And some are going to need training over and over and over again. Others, not so much. You tell them once, and you're good. It's done. Proverbs addresses loving a child by way of discipline. Proverbs 13, 24. He who withholds his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. Literally, that means seeks him diligently with discipline. So seeks the best for him with discipline. <coughs> the first part of that verse, he who withholds his rod hates his son. Hates? Really? Seriously? Hates? Like, that sounds pretty strong, right? Uh, well, in the original... The word hates here, it actually means hates. It's the same word used of Joseph's brothers, the feelings that they had towards Joseph. You know those brothers who planned to kill him and then they realized they could make a buck if they sold him instead? Those are the brothers. That's the feeling they had was hating Joseph. They despised him. That's the word, the same word is being used there. He who withholds his rod hates his son. It's used a bunch of other times in similar ways, including God's hatred of those who do iniquity, those that will suffer eternal damnation and God's righteous wrath. So it's a strong word. He's not, whoever wrote this in Proverbs, most likely Solomon, I'm guessing, but whoever wrote that, he's serious. God is serious by writing that through him. It's plainly unloving to not train children. Of course, it's plainly unloving to abuse a child as well. So there's a loving training in the middle somewhere. Authoritative, including correction and chastisement. So some parents are hesitant to use corporal training. You know, we talk about the rod. Some people were hesitant for that. Well, look at Proverbs 23, 13. It says, do not hold back discipline from the child. Although you strike him with the rod, he will not die. <laughs> now, you guys are snickering, but that's exactly, I mean, this seems like God's grace to us putting this verse in here. So that any of us that think, I don't want to use the rod on my child because it doesn't feel loving to do that. Well, I think this verse could be paraphrased. Don't worry. Go ahead and use the rod. It's not going to kill him. And in fact, the next verse, verse 14, you shall strike him with the rod and rescue his soul from Sheol. So not only is it not going to kill him, it's going to save him from death itself. And there's a philosophy in our culture of reasoning with a child instead of using discipline, including training and correction. The philosophy is based on the unbiblical idea that children are innately good and that children inherently have the ability to behave well and do what's right. It's simply not true. 
Romans 7 is clear that we all, even after being saved and with the power of the Holy Spirit, still struggle with a flesh that pulls us to rebel and not obey God. Even with the power of the Holy Spirit working in us, we still have a flesh that drives us, that wants us to sin. We still have that innate, diminished nature working in us. An unsaved child, or even an adult for that matter, is a slave to sin and naturally inclined to disobey rather than to obey. God's program includes both blessing and obedience and consequences and or discipline for dis disobedience. Parents represent God when they're training and disciplining their children. They must employ rewards and punishments, praise and encouragement. Now, in this session, we're discussing training. However, I do think at least one word should be said about encouraging children as well. Children must be disciplined and corrected when they sin in disobedience. They must be corrected. The scripture is clear. However, they must be praised and appreciated when they do what is right. We can't just give them the wrong all the time. We can't tell them the correction all the time. The person who is constantly corrected and never praised for doing the right thing is going to become demoralized and deflated. They're not, they're just going to get depressed. We can't train our children and constantly be training and training and training and everything that's wrong and never tell them when they do what's right. Whether it's in direct obedience to us or whether they are doing what's right in God's word and pleasing to God on their own. That's particularly when we should notice it. I saw that you did that. That was pleasing to God and pleasing to me. So we need to be mindful to be encouraging them because when we encourage them in doing what's right, they're going to be more willing to want to do more of what's right. And when correction is necessary, it's going to sting all the more because when they hear our praise and then we have to bring correction, that's not going to feel good. Now, a complimentary verse to Ephesians 6, 4, which we've talked about already. And I think I might have mentioned this one too, but Colossians 3, 21, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. Next point. So next point, so that being under encouragement. So next point under why. Proverbs 22, 15, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline will remove it far from him. Now, it says foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. We're going to plant on that here for a few minutes, okay? So keep that in mind. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. A child is going to have reasons, hear me say excuses, for why he or she disobeys. Now, this one, as some of you may know already, relates very well through the teen years, right? Sometimes. Proverbs 26, 4 and 5 says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you will also be like him. Answer a fool as his folly deserves, that he not be wise in his own eyes. Okay, so we just said that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Okay, so if we want to say this short form, and I don't really like to say it this way because it sounds a little harsh, but when you say, when, basically we can say children are fools, right? If foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, we can essentially just say children are fools in a nice way. We can see that. Now, going along with a fool's reasoning, or your child's reasoning when they are <laughs> foolish, or taking their reasoning as valid and useful makes us like them, makes us foolish as well. The admonishment of Proverbs is to answer the fool's reasoning with wisdom and show their excuses to be as foolish as they are. So we're only going to be able to do that, or at least we're only going to rightly do that, when we use God's word to do so. So when they're sinning and they're coming up with reasons and excuses for what they did, we should be able to show them the word and say, that's not what God says. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Psalm 111, 10, the fear or reverence of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. So essentially there's a contrast there. The child is foolishness bound up in them, and wisdom is God's word. And that's how we cure that foolishness, or we at least counter it. 
A child may have good reasons, so I said they have excuses, but they may have good reasons that align with God's word. They might have good reasons for doing whatever, well, they might have good reasons to talk to you about, or maybe you misunderstood or something. They, there's something you didn't get right, maybe, and they have answers that you didn't know about or something, and they can explain it to you. Just because they differ from you doesn't mean they're wrong. So we need to be careful to be getting the word right and applying it well. But we also be, need to be quick. We need to be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. We need to be hearing what they're saying because they may be speaking truth. They may have applied it wrongly, but we need to be mindful to hear what they say. Now, the child, if they're going to be saying something back to you at all, should be appealing with respect, and they are called to obey their parents and honor their parents joyfully whether they agree with the parents or not. So whether they're right or not, they're still called to obey. But we can't just shut them down and not listen. We need to be taking into consideration what they're saying and evaluating it by the word. Now, you guys might recognize this. Proverbs 29.9, when a wise man has a controversy with a foolish man, and this is a good one to keep in mind, even when you're, particularly if you're watching like Apology, apologist debates like, you know, creation versus evolution or atheism versus is there a God. You know, you watch these debates. Keep this verse in mind. When a wise man has a controversy with a foolish man, the foolish man either rages or laughs and there is no rest. Isn't that what happens? Guy gets put up against the wall. Well, children do it too. They get against the wall. They, their, their arguments aren't working out. What do they do? They scoff, they rage, they laugh, they shut down the argument, basically. So has anyone had a child respond to wisdom and reason with, scoff, with rage or scoffing? You, you may not have realized that that was biblical when they do that, right? One commentator said, from the Bible's point of view, it's impossible to shape a child's character without demonstrating the seriousness of wrongdoing through ret retributory punishment. Words aren't enough because they're so easily ignored. Painful punishment administered by loving parents drives home the message. So this is more of a practical thing, but the, child, the trained child is much safer from harm than the child who is left to disobey. Or even if he obeys, but he waits until the second, third, fourth time before he does it. This isn't a safe situation for kids. Yvonne and I um, were out with our kids at a restaurant. In fact, I think we were trying to figure out where we're gonna go, but we were already in a restaurant parking lot. And Yvonne and my daughter and her little three-year-old son went walking to the other side of the parking lot. Well, the rest of us were up at the other side of it. We didn't, they went away and we stayed up there. And so he decided to go back for some reason. He, you know, something caught his interest, he wanted to go back. So he runs out in the lane of the parking lot right? The, where the cars drive through. Now, this is winter at the beach, so there's nobody there. Like, there's cars there, but hardly anybody, right? So it wasn't a huge danger. But my daughter called him. He didn't listen. She called him again, and he didn't listen. He just is charging out there running. Well, she had to catch him, and when she did, it was to the car for a discipline. And it's, and, you know, you see the danger there. If he doesn't listen the first time, he can run out right in front of a car. And I'm, I'm, if, you have parent, if you have kids that can walk, if you have ones that are three years older, or maybe even before that, you guys have probably experienced this. I can't imagine any parent that has to get in and out of cars with kids hasn't experienced this to some degree. But they need to be able to listen. They need to hear the parent's voice the first time and obey. Yvonne and I were watching a movie recently, and in the movie there was a, a character who was a father, and he was bitter at his dead son because his son disobeyed him and died because of it. So the son was told to stay in the car. He didn't. He got out of the car, had an accident, broke his back, and died. The father was angry with the child for not obeying, and it was tearing up his life. Lost, it, lost his job, lost his marriage didn't have any feel, feel any reason to live but should he be bitter towards that child the father is the trainer 
So we need to take these things very seriously that it is for the safety of the child that they obey us the first time. Now, I know this can be a hard pill to swallow, but there are situations where a child's life or health are dependent on their training. I mean, you think of pools, electrical outlets, a whole bunch of other dangers that adults see but kids aren't going to see. I've told my kids over the years the difference between adults and children is that adults can see what may happen and children have no idea. So, little thing like, this is the example that always came up in our house anyway, putting the milk cup right here on the edge of the table, I can see that that's going on the floor, right? They're not going to see that. They just set it down. But there's bigger dangers, like there might be a car coming. So we need to keep that in mind, just on a very practical basis. The child should be trained to hear the parent's voice at any volume and obey the first time. Delayed obedience or obedience following repeated commands should not be the accepted standard. Consider, just consider this as a practical point. When a parent has to repeat himself, is he more likely to be tempted to anger and more tempted each time he has to repeat himself? Is that not true? We tell our child to do something, they don't do it. We say it a little louder the next time, they don't do it. We say it a little louder the next time, they still don't do it. Is our temperature rising? Usually it is. But if we train the child to hear our voice at a normal voice all the time, first time, we're doing them a good and we're doing us a good as a parent. We're, we're eliminating some temptation there for ourselves as well. If a child doesn't obey the first time, why does it make sense to us that the child will obey after being told another or a few times without us intervening and making them obey? Isn't that what happens? We say, stop doing that, stop doing that, stop doing it. And then we finally get up and make them stop doing it. But doesn't it make no sense at all that we would say, stop that, and they don't do it, that if we say it again, they're going to they're gonna stop? They're not. We always end up, in, well, I shouldn't say we always, but a lot of the time we end up just intervening to stop it. This is not training. Do you think that we can call it peaceful fruit of righteousness, as Hebrews 12 said at the end, when the child has been trained rightly? If we can tell a child to obey us, or we can train a child to obey us the first time we say something in a normal voice and they just do it, can we consider that to be the peaceful fruit of righteousness in Hebrews 12? So one parenting resource Yvonne and I read when, when our kids were very small, and it's one that I may not recommend to people, not without a bunch of warnings on top of it, but uh, it was related to parenting, uh, and he was talking about the immediate obedience the Amish train their horses with. So the Amish train their horses, and they're pulling carriages, and they train their horses to obey on barely more than a whisper. So the horse is always hearing them when they barely speak to them and obeying right away. And they train them this way because they are on highways. They're on the side of, a highway, they're on the side of highways with semis going by. I mean, there's huge dangers there. So they're protecting the horse, and they're protecting everybody in these carriages by making sure these horses obey at the smallest voice that they give them. And because they've trained them at the smallest voice, they obey at the smallest voice. And uh, I imagine uh, all of our kids are probably a little higher on the intelligence spectrum than horses are, although I know horses are really smart for you horse people, if there's any here <laughs> insulting horses. Um, Although it may not seem like it sometimes when you've repeated the same training session over and over again, that the kids aren't much smarter than horses. But I think they probably are. So the expectation for obedience is at even the calmest, quietest command the first time. When a child learns to obey like this, even the look will communicate your expectation. So then you can, there comes a time when they learn to obey, when you can just look at them and they know better to do whatever it is that they're about to do. Imagine the peace in a home where children understand the blessing of obedience and enjoy the trust of their parents. Children who obey like this are worthy of greater privilege and opportunity 
You can let them do a lot more when you can trust them not to do the things you tell them not to do. So it's good for them in that way. They're blessed in that way. So another thought on foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Parents need to help their children be wise about choosing their friends. It's also why, why parents uh, that have kids that go to school every day need to be mindful of the influence on their kids. Not just because of the trash that some schools teach, but the influence of all the other little foolish ones that are interacting with. They're around a bunch of others that have foolishness bound up in them. Essentially, schools, even Christian ones, and many home ones, are locations for congregating people with foolishness bound up in them. Right? I mean, if they're unbelievers, foolishness is bound up in them, and they are likely to be sinning. They are driven to sin. They are slaves to sin. So in short, it's a gathering place for fools. Of course, the same could be said for Sunday school classes or youth groups, even college ministries, uh, although I'm sure it's not the case here at Grace Bible. Uh, but some churches, that might be the case. Uh, but for this reason, parents need to be engaged and help their children be wise in the selection of friends rather than falling into friendships. They're going to they're gonna have friendships, but we don't want them falling into those friendships. We want them to be evaluating that. This reminded me of a, uh, something I read about William Wilberforce. And he was writing about his son who was away at school. And he says, his soft nature, he's describing somebody else. He says, his soft nature makes him the sport of his companions and the wicked and idle naturally attach themselves like dust and cleave like burrs. The wicked are going to take advantage of a child who's not choosing his friends. Proverbs 12, 26. The righteous is a guide to his neighbor, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. And you're saying, what does that have to do with choosing friends? Uh, well, Ryrie, my study Bible, Ryrie, he said, the note on this says, it, it should be translated, or a better translation might be, the righteous investigates his neighbor, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. The investigation is necessary in order to choose one's friends carefully for the way of the godless leads into error. And ch children don't know how to do this. Parents need to help them learn how to do it. Proverbs 13, 20, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. And Paul was quoting a Greek proverb in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. So does this mean children should never have unbelieving friends? <coughs> no. But the parents and the child just should be mindful of the influence of the friends. We're not called to be out of the world. We're called to be not of the world. Same goes for our kids, but we need to help them because they're not going to have the wisdom that a parent's going to have, particularly a parent who is in the Word on a regular basis. Proverbs 29, 15, the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child who gets his own way, literally, if he's left to himself, brings shame to his mother. We see this in the examples of Eli and David and Samuel in Scripture. All three of those men were considered godly men. David was considered the man after God's own heart. But his sons were terrible because he didn't train them. <laughs> okay, so on to when. We covered why, so now we're on to when. When is consistently. And this is an extremely common issue in parenting. It was an, it was an issue in our parenting, at least in my parenting. May, this may be the greatest issue with parenting as, as far as my experience of talking to parents is consistency. Consistency in the early years will habituate a child to obedience. Consistency is absolutely necessary. Inconsistency gives the child a perceived chance that he's not going to be punished, that he's not going to receive that discipline. If we're inconsistent, we punish one time and not the next, or we allow it to slide and then we punish them, then they're going to always have that in the back of their mind. They might get away with it. A lot of you might be able to relate to this, thinking back to when you were kids. You wanted to do something, you knew it was wrong, you could possibly and probably should have gotten disciplined for it, but you weren't disciplined for it last time, so you took your chances. <coughs> Nobody's nodding their heads, so... Maybe that was just me <clears throat> that had that problem. Anyway, you get the point. As close to the time, 
the, as far as when, as close to the time of the offense as possible. So they know, so you can talk about what the event that happened, what happened when they sinned, what happened when they disobeyed, and they know exactly because you just did it. Just happened. As close to the time as possible, do the training and discipline. Ecclesiastes 8.11, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. Now this verse is referring to God's delayed judgment. But it says sinners don't fear retribution because it doesn't happen immediately, so they just keep on sinning. It's the same thing with our kids. Essentially, the fear of immediate judgment and punishment deters sin and disobedience. When the expectation of immediate consequences is missing, people are emboldened to, people and children are emboldened to disobey. Now, regarding training with the rod, this is still under when? Until they are about 11 or 12 years old, usually. Um, any older than this, and they're too big to be spanked, and you're probably going to get fought back against anyway at that age, especially if they're boys, especially if they're big boys. Um, you're going to have problems. And maturity and puberty start making it an inappropriate situation for moms and dads as well. So what about when they're older? Well, you're going to have to wait until we get to the house section. I'll talk about that. Uh, so where is the next thing? Now, if you thought the answer to where was on the backside, <laughs> I'm sorry for the confusion because that comes in the house section. This is where as in like, where are you going to be when this happens, okay? Matthew 18, in private. If your brother sins, go to him in private. We need to give the same respect to our children. They deserve it. We would want to be corrected in private. Everybody would rather be corrected in private than in front of people. We need to give them that respect and love them in that way. Now, having a designated place in the home for training... Preferably not in their own space, like in their own room. Jay Adams writes in his books about having spaces for activities. Essentially, you don't study when you're laying in bed because the bed is for reading and other things, right, when you're married. Um, so it's not the place to study. The place to study is when you're sitting at the desk. And so essentially, places have designations of where what activity should happen there right so and this becomes part of the structure and routine of the disciplining process is they know where to go and how it's going to happen and it becomes very expected in our home it was the bedroom and yeah, our bedroom um, a gesture could let them know we would meet them there we didn't have to explain i'm going to meet you in this room this time we're going to go in the loft tonight or whatever they always knew it was going to be our room so let's go. We didn't even need to say it. I mean, a lot of times we didn't have to say anything. They knew where they were going. So they know to go to a room and we meet them there. They always knew where the training was going to happen. Go to my room was synonymous with it's time for a training session. And this may have also had the added benefit of our room being uninviting to them otherwise. <laughs> So there's no discussion about where to go. The process is consistent. Now, what if you're in public or you're at someone else's home? Well, maybe the rod will need to wait until you get home. Maybe the training session needs to wait until you get home. But you need to make sure you let the kid know right away, we're going to talk when we get home. And that's the worst anyway, because they got to feel the heat for as long as it takes to get home. And they're hoping you forget. So don't ever forget. <laughs> Do not embarrass your child in front of others. So try and keep it quiet. And the better they're trained, the more effectively you can do this. You can whisper to them. You can tell them, look, we don't need, you don't need to make a big fuss about it. You can tell them or even look at them and they know, and they just go and nobody else knows what's going on. If you can get away enough that others aren't aware, then this could be possible to do training in public or at someone else's home. Of course, you know, at your family's home, your sister, your brother, or your parents or something, if you're at their homes, or possibly even good friends, this shouldn't be an issue. And the car works if you have to. Okay, now the how. 
with love, with self-control, with authority. Now, with authority, I mean with the authority of God's word. Your authority means nothing apart from God's word. Our opinions, it eventually, if it's our opinion against their opinion, eventually they're going to be big enough that they don't care what our opinion is and they're going to do what they want anyway. God's word stands eternal. God's word is authoritative no matter where they're at or what they're doing, how old they are, in or out of your house. It doesn't matter. God's word is authoritative, and that's what we use for our authority. We submit to God's word. They submit to God's word. And so consequently, we can use the word all the time. And they're always subject to it. They're not always subject to our opinions and our desires and our wills. Ultimately, they just don't matter. Um, so I said, on, on, on the backside, in how? I already gave you that one, right? The God-ordained and designed place for correction with a rod, not the hand. Now, three reasons are in my mind as far as why not to use your hand. One, I never wanted my child to associate the pain of correction to my physical hand. I did, I did need to do it in a pinch, um, but I, I didn't want that to be the norm. Uh, with the hand, it's difficult to get a sting as opposed, as opposed to a jolt. So I don't know if you guys catch what I'm saying there. So if you're using a rod and you're using something appropriate, then you can get a sting and it gets their attention and then you can discuss what the word says about their sin. You're getting their attention. You're not trying to leave marks. That's not the point. You're just trying to make it very uncomfortable for them so you have an opportunity to open up the word and talk to them or talk to them about what they did wrong and then talk to them about what they should do right. Um, third thing about the hand, particularly with a small child, the weight of a hand spanking them can give a jolt to their spine that could result in lasting pain. Because you talk about a very small child in order to just swat them. you got to move your heavy hand, so to speak, on them. And that's, could not, that could go poorly. So um, I'm going a few minutes over here. I hope you'll forgive me. Um, I'm going to read to you what Yvonne wrote in her book, um, Mommy Tend Your Heart, about how we did training in our house. Um, so it was, the, the child was instructed to go to our bedroom, which was the designated place for re receiving discipline. It was private and free from interruptions. It allowed us to speak to the child about his sin and administer the spanking without causing humiliation in front of others. Before administering the spanking, we typically asked the child to explain why they were receiving the discipline. This eliminated potential confusion or misunderstanding on both sides. He was then instructed to lie over the bed with his hands up beside his head so he wouldn't accidentally get swatted. So we were careful to make sure their hands weren't somewhere where they're going to do this, right? They're up where they're not going to get swatted. His little backside would be facing up while his legs would hang over the edge of the bed. With the paddle, we administered swats directly to his backside, carefully avoiding his back and legs. We swatted only hard enough for him to feel the pain of spanking, but not hard enough to bruise or cause welds. One particular child often struggled to lay still, which made spanking without causing him harm difficult. In this case, we would sit on the edge of the bed, the child's legs were firmly and gently, they'd, we'd hold them between our legs, lean him over the knee, and do it that way so that he, we were protecting him from getting hurt in some other way. This gave us greater control and prevented us from swatting flailing arms or legs. If, when the spanking was over, the child stood up in defiance or rebellious anger, we would encourage him to change his attitude. If he refused, we would instruct him to turn over for another spanking. So essentially, if they kept rebelling and they kept resisting, they were going to continue to get spankings until it stopped. Because that's the point. Our goal was to bring heart change through the teaching of God's word. If he was still angry and rebellious after the spanking, he would not listen to biblical instruction. Thus, another spanking was necessary. Once the spanking was finished, we would take him on our lap in an embrace and discuss his sin. It allowed us to bring God's word to bear on the situation and helped him to understand how he had displeased God. Remember? How he had displeased God. Not how he displeased us. 
how he displeased God is what's important. We also discussed what he could do differently in the future. Our goal was to leave the bedroom in harmony with all traces of sin and discipline gone. My husband often tickled the kids or joked with them, so they left the room in laughter rather than in anger or tears. And so you want to, as I was talking about, and when I'm talking more about this as we go on, but talking about keeping that relationship with your child. And so if you swap them and you bring all this crying and pain, and then it's not resolved in the end, and it's just left, they might be left to be bitter or to grow bitter or to continue to be angry as they leave the room. They fake it that they're not angry, and then they leave and they're angry. But if you are search, if you're shooting for heart change and shooting to keep that relationship with them, it can be a loving thing. There needs to be a controlled and expected process. This helps in the consistency, as in when it's administered and what happens. MacArthur says, that's John MacArthur. <laughs> if your spanking leaves bruises or welts that are still visible the following day, you are striking the child too hard. Short stinging strokes to the backside where the natural padding is most plentiful will not injure the child but should be painful enough to make the consequences of disobedience sufficiently distasteful and unforgettable. Now, um, I'm talking about the rod. So let me tell you what was the rod in our home, just so you have an idea. We're not talking about a baseball bat here, okay? Uh, we're not talking about a two by four. We're not even talking about a one by two or something. Um, so we, we <laughs> so early on, somehow, uh, Yvonne grew up on the mission field in Papua New Guinea. And somehow we ended up with a stirring, hardwood st carved stirring stick for like stirring stuff in Papua New Guinea. I don't know what. <laughs> so anyway, they would stir with this thing. And it was that long or so. And then one day it disappeared. I don't know where it went. It just disappeared. Uh, one of the children certainly uh, made it disappear. <laughs> <laughs> but then, not long after that, when we had to like resort to using wooden spoons or something instead, uh, which wasn't as effective. So this thing was that wide, about that long, and probably about that thick. So it was easy to just give a swap. That's what you're trying to do, just get a flick. Make some pain. Not harm, it, not harm the child. And so uh, not long after that, the children were out for a walk with Yvonne, and somebody had lost their bamboo back scratcher. So it was a, you know what a back scratcher looks like, right? Well, this thing's made out of bamboo, so it's a nice, it's got a little flex to it, got enough weight to it. That immediately became the new rod in our home. And it worked very effectively for a long time. Is that around? It's not around. We gave it to one of our friends so she could swat her kids. Isn't that nice of us? Okay. So, all right. Um, Um, so, you want to talk about what the child did wrong, what they should do in the future. Do it with patience. Remember, it's a long haul. It might take multiple times. Without anger. The anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. James 1.20. We are not training in godliness when we're angry, when we're disciplining. There's no room for anger. There's no room for being short with a child. Being, being willing to put in the time. You know that, who is it, Captain America or somebody says, I can do this all day? You know? Calmly and matter-of-factly, this is not going to end until we do it, until you break, essentially. And you don't need to say it like that, but that's, they need to know that's the case. Communicate to the child that training him in righteousness is, a way more important, is way more important than yours or his temporary comfort or convenience. So you're going to do it until the result is had. Because it's more important for you to be inconvenienced than for them to leave without having been trained. Multiple spankings for the same repeated offense, so you just keep doing it until it solves the problem. Multiple spankings when lying is involved. We spank twice for lying. So if a child was, was disobedient and sinned, we, they got the regular discipline. If they lied about it, they got two automatically. And then you know if they rebelled, they get another one or another one. So MacArthur said, with his children, the consequence for lying was double what it was for other offenses. So essentially with MacArthur, you lied, you were getting three the first time. And he said the reason, and, I, and, and hear this, the reason, because of, this is MacArthur's, this is a quote from him, 
Because if a person can train his conscience to live with a lie, that person will be susceptible to any sin. If you can cover your sin with a lie, and if you condition your conscience to tolerate a lie, your conscience will, in effect, become useless to keep you from any sin. So other forms of discipline. Beyond spanking, you know, if you're fostering a child, you need to do something else. This is when discipline needs to get more creative. Um, I'd say if you have kids with phones and you plan on taking them away, you also better be pretty tech savvy and know how to lock down your Wi-Fi system and everything else in your house too. Okay, you're just gonna need to be on top of this stuff. Same goes for cars. Although this becomes way more complicated when they start working, uh, they should be at least paying for their insurance and gas. But if it's your car, you can take it away. If it's their car, the more autonomy they have, the harder it is to train. So I, I know that complicates things for a lot of people, so I'm going to leave that where it is. But just think these things through before you get to the time. Before you get to, I'm just going to give my kid a car. Okay, well, then you might put yourself in a hole because you can't take the car away at some point. So just think these. I'm not saying what to do. I'm just saying think it through. <laughs> MacArthur said he often, this, this is in the vein of more variety of ways to train. MacArthur said, he so often had his mouth washed out with soap that when he hears foul language now, he can taste the soap. <laughs> so it was effective. Uh, manage your screen time of video games. Uh, reason, you, know, you can reason that out from Proverbs regarding being lazy or, and, and uh, being a slugger. Just be, you know, not that you can't let them play, but just manage it. Manage, and, and that can be something that you can use for punishment as well or for training, discipline. Uh, generally, timeout is not a good plan. If the timeout is given with an assignment to consider their sin and compose something of a personal improvement project type essay where they are writing about what their sin was and how the word applies to it and how they need to change in the future, that might work. Maybe. But a lot of timeout just leaves the kid to stew and become bitter while they're sitting there and start plotting on how they're going to do it next time and not get caught. So it's just, timeout is not a good plan. Work. Have you have stuff around your house that needs to get done that you can't get to because you're too busy working to make your child's life leisurely and fun and playtime at home? Might be time to get him to do that work if, if, he needs, if he's over spanking age and he needs something to do to be corrected. We had chickens for a while. One of our sons took care of the chickens for about a year as a form of discipline. <laughs> I think he just kept getting in more trouble and it kept getting adding on. Uh, one day he was yelling from hanging on the chain link fence surrounding the chicken area because a couple of roosters had chased him. And he jumped up on the, he was screaming and Yvonne had to go out and rescue him. Uh, we have friends who had their sons move a pile of rocks from one spot to another for discipline. The next time discipline came around, they moved the rocks from there to the other place again. So they just had them work. So maybe buying a pallet of stone pavers would be a good preemptive plan. Uh, we didn't pay for our kids to go to youth camp when they were old enough to make money. We let them pay for it. If it, was enough, if it was important enough for them to go, they could pay for it. Well, the plan was laid out to all the kids. One of our sons, chicken son, didn't. he spent his money on junk food and stuff like that. Instead, when the time came, all he could do was wave to all the other kids on the trip leaving in the bus. There were no hard feelings toward us with that. He just learned a lesson. When a child is in the habit of, of obedience, he can enjoy sweet fellowship with his parents that would not exist in his disobedience. He can maintain relationship with the child, just like us and God. When we sin, we distance ourselves. We mess up our relationship with God. We put a barrier to our strong relationship with him, to our close relationship with him. It's the same thing with a child. They put distance between, they put distance in the relationship between the parent and the child when they sin and when they disobey. But when they obey and they're, tra they're trained well, they can enjoy sweet fellowship with the parents. The child, in that case, the child gains trust and responsibility. And as he proves his trustworthiness, a parent should allow him more privilege and opportunity. The untrained and untrustworthy child cannot be allowed the same privileges and freedoms that a trained child can enjoy. So they enjoy more. They enjoy life with parents. So in short, parents are commanded to train up their children that they might recognize their sinful state and their need for the Savior. 
This made clear, this is made clear as parents lovingly and consistently train and correct their children using God's word as the standard. When a child trusts in Christ, the parent has the wonderful privilege of assisting him or her as they grow in spiritual maturity and likeness to Jesus. Children are only going to get the right message by loving, patient, God-honoring training. If parents discipline from a desire to conform a child to the parent's selfish desires or opinions, the training will fall flat. Maybe not in the short term because anyone bigger and stronger can bring about behavior modification. But in the long term, a child will decide he doesn't agree with the parent's desires and choose his own selfish way instead. All training must be focused on obedience to God's word and will. So that concludes the session. Uh, would you like to close the prayer? Yeah, I'll do that. You want to do that? Yeah. Okay. So tomorrow, if I heard you correctly, Yvonne's going to speak directly to the mothers. That's correct. And you to the fathers. That's correct. Okay. And if we have questions, we need to have those for tomorrow, right? Yeah. To, to, to really question and answer at the end of those sessions. Okay. All right. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that you are uh, to us a perfect and flawless Father. Uh, thank you for the wise way that you handle our lives, that you uh, measure out to us the perfect proportions of uh, discipline and of encouragement and of trials and of blessings. And Lord, you work all these things, Father, for our good. I pray that you would just grow us as parents in love for our children. Uh, as Craig was talking, I, I'm very convicted of loving myself uh, many times more than I love my children. And I'm also convicted of laziness uh, with regard to how I discipline my children. So uh, help me, help us to love our children enough to train them well. Uh, grow us in an awareness of your fatherly love for us so that we will be able to love our children in the way that we have been loved by you, Father. Uh, it's late, and I pray that you get us all home safe, uh, that you would help us to rest well tonight, and that you would help us to wake up uh, with energy, uh, with zeal, uh, to grow as parents, and that you would get us back out here in the morning uh, with a heart ready to hear from you. Uh, again, thank you for letting us be here. Help, help those things that are most pertinent to us individually uh, to percolate and sink down into our souls as we drive home. Help us to think about these things. And uh, Father, uh, just thank you so much for your patience with us. Uh, help us to have this same kind of attitude toward our kids that you've had toward us, this love, this patience, uh, this godly firmness and discipline. And Lord, uh, just be exalted in our families, in our homes, uh, in our churches. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 8 o'clock tomorrow we'll have breakfast. 8.30. 8.30 tomorrow we will have breakfast. You're a little bit